Well, as we approach the Christmas season, perhaps a little thought about it would be timely. A great many people are not aware that the so-called Christmas festival is one of the oldest known to mankind. It was developed in Egypt four or five thousand years ago, and also was known in China and India. It was a very ancient festival that developed with the understanding of the astronomical structure of the solar system. As soon as the zodiac was identified and the seasons were noted by means of primitive stone instruments, perhaps pyramids, perhaps Stonehenge, but certainly ancient methods for calculating the solstices and the equinoxes. The winter solstice was set aside from the beginning as the most sacred of all human festivals because it was honored the annual birthday of the sun. It was on that day that the sun moved northward and began its great journey to bring fertility and security to the peoples of the northern hemisphere. That these rituals, rites, and ceremonies were nearly all aligned to the northern hemisphere, we know. In any way, in any event, probably the most closely associated with our modern festival was the Roman Saturnalia. This was a great festival of the winter solstice. And in the course of the development of Roman society, it finally extended for a period of seven days. One of the most interesting phases of the Saturnalia was the fact that now during this ceremony, this festival, uh, owners exchanged places with their servants, and the master of the house served the slaves at dinner. This peculiar thing extended to other customs, which included a number of the forms of tolerance not normally practiced in Roman society. This may have had an effect upon the sacredness of the festival in early Christianity, because during the Roman Saturnalia, no one would notice what Christians were doing. They were too busy fulfilling their own ancient rites, ceremonies, and customs. In any event, we know that the original development of the festival was one to remind us all of the benevolence of heaven. It came as a proof that we owed proper gratitude, tribute, and obedience to the divine and natural laws of the world in which we live. The Saturnalia was celebrated to the Father of the Gods, and it was a ceremony of uh, acceptances, of tributes, of recognitions, and of the renewal of binding ties between families, peoples, and nations. In other words, probably, it came as close as anything we have to the foundations of the concept of world unity and peace. Now, today in Christendom uh, and related fields, the ceremony or festival of Christian, uh, Christmas is still widely celebrated. We know that at the present time, approximately one out of every four persons living on earth has at least some close to Christian observances. It is therefore probable that in all, that nearly one and a half billion people on this planet honor Christmas with some type of festival. This is the largest single unit that exists far exceeding all atheists, nonconformists, and unbelievers. It is a festival in which many nations with different languages, different actual sectarian differences, are all able to unite in the ceremony of the annual celebration of the birth of Christ. This is therefore a tremendous basic strength in times of trouble. It indicates one of the largest foundations upon which unity of belief and unity of custom uh, can be established. We also know that from travel and from converse with the members of other religions, that most of the non-Christian nations also respect Christmas. 
many of them have something similar to it in their own beliefs. Some have accepted part of the Christian belief. And in nearly all non-Christian countries, there are large groups of persons who honor, uh, reverence, regard, or esteem the early history of Christianity. So in all probabilities, we are probably talking about closer to two billion persons who respect Christmas or celebrate it. Now, this is a tremendous number of people. This is the one occasion on which they all seem to get together. The second most probably formal feast of Christendom is Easter. But uh, Christmas has pre precedence over Easter in numerical acceptances. It is the one great festival of mankind since the very earliest time. A broad, temple, deep, pious, gentle acceptance of the infinite benevolence of the universe in which we live. A reminder to each of us that in this one life we live and move and have our beings, that in one great tremendous strength all things exist, and all things exist in harmony and peace. The great aggressor, the great um, problem is mankind. The human being himself, with his personal ideas, attitudes, beliefs, and pressures, has gradually diluted the significance of Christmas to some degree. But even in this case, it is more to the good side that we must turn our attention. There is a great popular belief today that Christmas is a storekeeper's holiday. Well, it probably is to some degree, but there's even more to it than that. We are told, for instance, from a purely business, economic, physical standpoint, that the abolition of gifting, of gift giving in Christmas, would probably run half of, a, of European and American economics into bankruptcy. In other words, if we want to stop giving gifts, be prepared for another five or ten million unemployed people. Therefore, while the motive may not be perfect by any means. Is until a better way is found to handle the entire economics of mankind. Christmas combines a religious ceremony with a protective economical uh, cover over our world business and organizations. Now the question also arises, is Christmas a child's festival? It has been for a long time, but... This is also a comparatively late development. Christmas was a festival for all, young and old. Uh, Christmas was not limited in any sense to the little ones, although they shared in its various festivities. Up to the present century, Christmas was a comparatively simple festival. Most people made the gifts which they exchanged, and those who gave otherwise usually gave necessary things to help to protect the security of the recipient's family. Today much of this has been changed, but with it has also come something that may be uh, all right, but I just can't sort of like it. It, it, isn't, it isn't pleasing to me. Uh, there's something about the idea of people being too busy, too tired, or too far broke to celebrate Christmas. I just cannot feel this way about it. It doesn't seem to me that it is proper or natural to assume that the average individual just doesn't want to have Christmas. And his excuse is almost always the same, that it's expensive, time-consuming, and comparatively unimportant. Uh, it is not too time-consuming. It is not necessarily working a hardship on people. Today and tomorrow and the rest of the week, millions of people are going to contribute to the needs of the needy. They are going to give tremendous amounts of time, thought, and effort to the serving of the poor, the sick, and those who have come as strangers to this land and have no home and no means of survival. This is the time when something inside of most people rises up 
with a humanitarian instinct. And that instinct is really the spirit of Christmas. It is the sudden realization of sharing with those in need. Now, the people most likely to dislike this are the people who do not like to share. The individual who wants to keep all he has and begrudges anything he gives away uh, may downgrade Christmas, but he is also downgrading himself. He is breaking a pact with the universe. He is standing against the ancient rites for which Christmas is the modern expression. The Saturnalia was the recognition by the individual, by collective humanity, that all we have and all we are is due to the bounty of providence. All of our hopes and dreams and aspirations, our prayers, are turned to the invisible source of good in the hope that it will protect us, guard us, and guide us through all the years of our lives. Then sometime long ago, they set up a festival to honor this concept, to make sure that the individual realized his indebtedness to the universe, to other people around him, to his nation, and to his own personal life. These things have to have some recognition. And up to the present time, we have never set aside anywhere a true ceremony of bestowing of what we have to the support of what we are. The desire and search and effort to build a closer relationship with the humanitarianism that is present everywhere in the natural human instincts. We are gradually destroying them as we are destroying many other overtones. And in the so-called commercialization, we must realize that it is our own personal attitude that results in commercialization. We also realize that uh, there's a lot of money wasted, surely. But there is also a great deal of joy given with it. It is something that it is much more important to the person who gives than it is to the person who receives. The recipient may or may not appreciate, but if the giver is in there with something in his own heart and soul, he will remember the lines in the poem of Sir Longfall, the gift without the giver is bare. So in old times we made things. We made little pictures. The children knitted and embroidered. All kinds of things were made. The men did the whittling and the egg boxes and such you peg shoes. In those days, the family was very strong, and the respect for the members of the family transformed giving into a privilege rather than a responsibility. It's rather now different, but it would be nice if it could come back to some of the things that we really believe in. Now, in our religion today, we are more or less intellectualized. We have many different beliefs. Many of them are noble and beautiful. Most of them, however, are served by persons who do not fully contribute to what they con their conviction requires. We do not really have a time set aside so that each one of us can for a moment participate in the gifts and the power to bestow happiness. That we can forget our own personal interests for a few days at least, and think first of others, and of the pleasure and the joy that we can give them. Part of this story is locked, of course, in the person of St. Nicholas of Myra, who was the original Santa Claus. Now, the original Santa Claus, of course, is really the symbol of the benevolence in human nature. It is a magnificent symbolism a beautiful legend, a beautiful emblem of something. Santa Claus is the benevolence in the human heart. It is that which we are in ourselves, which wish causes us to bestow happiness, bestow service, bestow need to those whom we care for and for our world in general. We are therefore, all of us, in a sense, capable of becoming a form of Santa Claus we sometimes realize that, as it was in a paper article many years ago, 
that no one can see Santa Claus, therefore most people do not believe he exists. Well, this is very nice. We go on modification. We don't see God, but we have a suspicion that he exists. But he doesn't exist as an old man with a long beard, nor Santa Claus with his red hat. The principles of these powers are in our own consciousness. Christmas is a release from within ourselves of an eternal solicitude for life. It is something that once a year at least we are able to gather into a pattern of some nature and for, for a moment become a friend of humanity in general. If we are ever to bring religions together on a common ground, we realize that we have about two billion religious people to work with. These religious people are all, under one name or another, dedicated to the humanity of man, to the preservation of good, to the fulfillment of need, to the blessings of the young. And all these things are part of the Christmas story, the Christmas story of the gifts that are brought to the children. What are they? The gifts of a thoughtful parent, the gifts of protection and care and love and affection, the solicitude we feel for the young, the deep love we have for our own kith and kin. These are the things that are the invisible gifts. They are the principle behind giving. And if that inner principle of innate affection and generosity is not there, or is not allowed to express itself, then the exchange of physical mementos is comparatively meaningless. Because we must recognize in Christmas a cosmic mysticism, a cosmic mystery, a mystery involving the benevolence of life, the mystery of that one being that we all are, that we are no longer people separated by race or religion or t distance. We are all part of one love, one affection which we share. The mother in Africa loves her child just as much as the mother in America. This affection is part of a love gift that comes to humanity. And God so loved the world that he bestowed upon it his only begotten Son. The actual ceremony of Christmas is therefore repeated as a living something in our hearts. I've watched a great many people over the years and their attitudes on Christmas. They get their Christmas problems all mixed up with politics and economics and sociology and denominationalism, and creedal boundaries, and they also feel some way that it is no longer necessary to have a sacred value in Christmas. Christmas is a time for vacations. It is time for an extra golf game. It is a time for overeating and to a certain measure over, over uh, drinking or whatever it may be. But actually, these are the false things we have put on top and to the surface, using Christmas as another name for vacation. And nothing could be further from the truth. If there is a day in the whole year which is not a vacation, it is Christmas. It is a day in which the very best insight of ourselves must come out in common service to others. This is the day in the Roman Saturnalia, when the owner of the establishment freed his slaves for a day or for a week and served them and did anything they wanted him to do. Today we don't have quite that approach to it, but it is true that on Christmas we can level out all of the inequalities of life and realize that behind all the differences we see, there is one great spiritual integrity. And when we lose sight of this, we've lost sight of everything. We've lost it all when we cannot practice the invisible presence of divine and infinite love. So we come to think of that today, or coming up this week, as a ritual of glorification, a ritual of remembrance, 
a reordination to the major values of life, a consecration to love, truth, and beauty, and a resolution to live a better life in the year that lies ahead. Among the ancients, the Egyptians and others, the winter solstice was held with great anxiety. Even the primitive people of the Western Hemisphere, the Indian tribes of Central and South America, waited hopefully, expectantly, fearfully for that moment when the new sun god was born. Would he come? Would there be another year? This rested with a providence beyond ourselves. And even science today knows that if something wrong occurred way out in space, we might never know a further existence. But in those moments of uncertainty, not knowing what was to come, whether there would be another year of opportunity, suddenly the calculation came through. The sun god was born again. In that moment, jubilation took over. Everyone rejoiced because, in, their, in the words of the old times, humanity was given another opportunity to live, to grow, to love, and to serve. It was a blessed giving of time, of opportunity. It was another chance to redeem the weaknesses of our own natures. It was a time to correct our mistakes. It was a time to do thousands of little wonderful and beautiful things we never had time to do before. A new year was a new birth. With the old year, the old birth died. There was no longer the old man with the scythe, who is Saturn. Now he had gone and left in his place a robust little baby that was to grow up into another year. All of this symbolism, however, involved a thanksgiving for on that first day after the winter solstice, eternal life bestowed itself again upon mankind. Uh, the cold of winter slowly passed away, and the rejoicing of the spring was a repetition of the proof that life had come back. And the grass and the flowers and the birds and everything in nature, in its own way, bore witness to the mystery of the Incarnation. It was a wonderful, beautiful privilege to be part of something that was going to go on and give us all an opportunity to correct the faults, to mend the breaks, to overcome the animosities, and to make certain that to the best of our own abilities we will reduce or relieve the sufferings of our fellow human creatures. It is also a day of dedication to the protection of our natural resources, a day to be kind not only to each other but to all living things, a day to recognize the reality of life, the inevitability of the growth by which all things come finally to the fullness of themselves. So the great gift we get on the last day of the old year is the promise of a new year. And we can think back a little bit to see what we did with the last one. And when we do that, we might be surprised, might be pleased, but there's quite a chance we'd be disappointed. Disappointed in ourselves and what we had done. Our inability to rise to an emergency. Our incapacity to overlook a grudge or forgive a slight of some kind. We will look back upon a year in which we compromised many principles for expediency. But we look forward to a year in which strength within ourselves, the divine life and light in us, will make it possible for us to do better in the future. So as we come into this year, or come to the end of the old one, we bid a sort of sad farewell to the past, and reach out to take the hand of the little one who is born to become the new year. And in that, we begin to think about resolutions. Now, resolutions are part of New Year's and have been for a long time. We make great decisions as to what we're going to do, and these decisions sometimes last as long as a week or ten days. Then they slip back into the old patterns. But with the resolutions on the the uh, mystery of the Incarnation. 
uh, all these growth processes can be lengthened and intensified and certified so that things will really be better. So on Christmas, let's see what we can do. First of all, we can bestow affection gently and impersonally but deeply upon all who need, who, who we can recognize that we can be kind, that we can be generous, and that we can sacrifice something that we might want to do ourselves to make life better for those whose troubles are more immediate. It's a year, therefore, is an opportunity of dedication. In the ancient rites and mysteries of antiquity, those who entered into the initiation rites were bound by the most profound obligations of mutual service, admiration, charity, and understanding. Charity in this case comes from the same word as love, charitas, and it recognizes no division of race or of any artificial boundaries. It is a universal acceptance of the inevitability of the weakness of human nature, but also the possibility that each of us in some way can strengthen those parts of our natures which are most essential to the common good of mankind. It is at the winter solstice also that the Prince of Peace comes, and the Prince of Peace is sorely needed today. And among those that are involved in desperate circumstances, many are Christian, many have belonged to various denominations of the Christian faith. Yet members of these denominations are actually attacking, killing, and torturing each other. This is something that really belongs uh, to a deeper level of problem than we like to assume. We think the United Nations could solve it, or that some few more conferences will reduce the difficulties, or that a few more laws will heal up the sufferings of crime. These things are not true. The only thing that's going to heal the whole thing is the one inevitable gift we have received from God, infinite love. There is no other solution. There is no, no way of getting over the divisions unless we begin to emphasize the unities. Until we begin to, good, to see good in others, there will be no improvement in the world in general. We will never legislate peace we must experience it as a divine mystery in our own hearts. Which brings us, therefore, to the real significance of Christmas for us all. Christmas is a mystical experience made flesh. It is something that reminds us of experiences which cannot be entirely put into words. These experiences we link together under the general heading of mysticism. Mysticism is an inward experience of a divine reality. It is something that arises in our own nature. It is not bestowed from the outside. It is not communicated by instruction. It is a moving inward to a source of the infinite within ourselves. A mystics have in every case found that the deeper they went into themselves, the closer they came to God. The mystic is not egocentric. He is not set up as a person consisting of better qualities than others. He is a truth seeker, and he has discovered that the only way that he can become a true seeker is to be quiet, to serve, to give, and to forgive. These are the qualities of the superior person and this simple truth was made clear in China by Confucius, 600 B.C. We have to all make this journey, this mystical experience journey, in search of the one source of every good that exists in the world. Now, there are many paths that lead some way in that direction, but the experience itself comes from a very firm quiet dedication. The individual has to impose certain rules upon himself. He cannot grow without his own consent. Growth cannot be forced upon him by his bodily ailments nor anything else. 
Growth is an experience that arises where the individual becomes increasingly aware of his own responsibility as part of humanity, that he is part of a great system, a system which depends for its survival upon human integrity. This integrity has been violated time and time again and is being violated every day now. But this integrity can also be, in a sense, strengthened. One of the simplest and the most original and, be and proper beginnings to the establishment of this type of experience is the cultivation of personal quietude, the determination not to permit the clouds and storms of mental and emotional pressures to disturb the climate of the heart. The heart must be protected. Physically, it is the source of physical life. Spiritually, it is the source of those great emotions, feelings, and beliefs upon which humanity depends for survival. So in quietude and in the accomplishment of peace, we set ourselves apart. We are told in the ancient scriptures that a place has to be set apart. And in this place there can be no conflict, there can be no worldliness, there can be no uh, discord. There must be a holy of holies set apart, a part set to contain or experience the presence of something superior in ourselves. We call this peace, and we find it in various ways, but we always find it when we are really seeking to understand life. Uh, Lao Tzu, the Chinese sage, as a child, found it sitting on the side of a hill overlooking the great mountains of northern China. Buddha found it under a tree. Each one in his own way has to experience this inward personal uh, devotion, dedication. A mystical experience must come to the individual from within himself. He cannot create this experience. He cannot force it. But if he is still and knows God, he will experience it. So in Christmas time in this t season, those who want to really understand and know Christmas must recognize it as a symbol of the quietude of the human heart. It is the sign in which uh, the use of the word children applies not simply to those of physical childhood. It means that we are all children when it comes into the presence of the divine. We are all little ones waiting to receive the blessings of heaven. We must accept very often without understanding some of the things that we know or believe or think. But with it all, it is our right as little children to be grateful to the eternal parental power that has given us everything that we have and are. Gradually, in spite of the pressures of economics, militarism, and international politics, the human heart is unfolding. There are more and more people who begin to understand the mysteries of the inner life. There are new groups rising all the time and older ones that are strengthening and receiving more and more popular recognition. The realization that the beginning of world peace is personal freedom from stress and the tension of ambition and competition. It has to come. Now, there are many probably who won't want it to come because they have become so accustomed to their miseries that they are like narcotic addicts. Com competition and mutual hatreds and animosities have produced a kind of narcotic habit the individual feels he must dislike something. He also feels that he must be at this time a pessimist. He must recognize nothing but the troubles. He must not believe that there is a real practical solution. And yet there always has been and always will be. The individual coming into the world has brought his solution with him, but he doesn't know it. Therefore, he has to gradually find out the reason for himself and the things that he thinks and the things that he does. And Christmas is a wonderful opportunity for a little while to simply quietly contemplate these matters, 
contemplate the gift from within, that actually our life is a life in soul, not a life in body. Our body is merely the appendage of a powerful spiritual entity. This entity is blocked by negative thought, negative emotion, and negative action. Even more than that, the power of this spiritual or soul being within us is perverted and corrupted. We take the gift of life which God has given us and we use it to destroy. We use it to advance our own means. We take a, a point of view that life is an instrument of advantage. We are not willing to accept it as the basis of all growth that is natural. So in these hard times, as always in hard times, one nation after another has gone through them. We have to come back again as little children studying in the College of the Holy Spirit. We have to come back to the mystical overtones with which we have been endowed, but which we have grossly neglected. And among those things that we have to do at Christmas time is to prove that in the moment of greatest opportunity to be kind, that we do not hold back that the, when the real time comes when we might do something which is within our understanding, selfishness or competition creep in and we don't do it. This is a time to forgive and forget the past, to remember that each day is a new life and that there are many opportunities to express the beauties that we have in ourselves. But we want to hang on to certain objections we want to read the media and be moved by it in a negative way. We do not realize that every problem we face today is, in a, is a concealed opportunity to solve problems. But we still keep on making the problems and doing as we please. And it's the same with Christmas. Worrying, worrying about how to physically meet the obligations of family, friends, associates. We therefore try to figure some way out of not to forget the people we should remember, to try to find something that we can give to this or that or those. This becomes an overwhelming um, attitude instead of the attitude of a, of a simple, genuine desire to indicate affection in some symbolical way. Now, there are many ways we can do it. We doesn't necessarily result in expensive gifts or something of this kind. It is giving of ourselves in some capacity. It is the word of encouragement in moment of need. It is association and kindness for the lonely. It is remembering those who need to be remembered. All kinds of things that help to make life better for others. But most of all, unless we are self-centered with ulterior motives and do things simply to be appreciated. If we do it in the right mood and in the right way and in the right unselfish manner, we grow. Something spiritual awakens in us. Some and we think that we have done reacts as a blessed experience in our own lives. And we all need these experiences today. Homes are fragile, broken easily. Children are neglected. Labor is not consistent in its dedication to its employment. All things are more or less half done because there's no heart behind them. And we insist that the way the world is acting, we can't have a heart. We insist that we don't like to partake in something that we know is basically wrong. And so we use excuses of one kind and another, not necessarily because they're all valid, but because they help to relieve our sense of responsibility for anybody except ourselves. So that when we give something, we think of the loss to ourselves and not the good of others. This type of thinking is not any good and has resulted in the problems we have today. America is a blessed country in many respects in spite of all its problems because in this country we are entitled to a private life. We can live better if we want to. We can be more kind if we wish. We are not under a police state. 
We are not in something in which we do not even dare to worship God. We are here with an opportunity to do all kinds of beautiful things. And by nature, we do them. And if we added up all the nice things we have done in the last 50 years, it would make a very substantial mountain of uh, accomplishments. But as time goes on, we get tired, we get disillusioned, little fretting and hating come in, and there seems no way to avoid it. But Christmas is the time of the great cleansing. It is the time in which we wash the soul by forgetting ourselves for a moment and thinking about someone else. It is the removal of the center of attention from our own personal pleasures, our own attachments, our own possessions, uh, to the problems of a larger world and a larger life. Somehow in this world, we must learn to be citizens of two worlds at the same time. We must live in this material world with its problems, but we must also keep alive the spiritual flame within ourselves. If that goes out, all else is lost. And this spiritual flame has to be some way symbolized. And it can be symbolized by a sort of mystical experience that we can have if we so desire. We can be very still. We can be very dedicated in a way. And we can get behind attitudes. We can find that in the very soul of ourselves, we are all kindly, good, generous, thoughtful, and basically happy people. Down underneath, every positive virtue that can be considered is there. Our love of truth is there even when we make misstatements. Our love of peace is there even when we declare war. Down inside of us is the seed, the, the heart, the core of things, that mustard seed that is described in the parable. In each one of us, there is an, a, an abundance of all grace, all beauty, all love, and all kindness. But between that and our present consciousness, we have built a kind of wall. We have built a wall of so-called practicality, in which it doesn't pay to do this and it's too expensive to do that. These kind of things cripple this other power. Now, the life within ourselves is not the kind that's going to run us into bankruptcy, because the spirit in man is not dealing with material things. It is dealing with motives. It is dealing with principles. It is dealing with the kind word and the thoughtful service of others. It is not something that is going to take away everything we have. All it is going to take away is that part of what we have that is no good in the first place or is giving us more trouble than it's worth. We are citizens of a kind of world that is sort of ruled over by a combination of Santa Claus and the old god Saturn, a world in which tremendous truths exist, which we have been carefully educated out of. We are being told constantly that life is a struggle for survival, when in reality, life is always victorious and is a tremendous power within ourselves, which we have blocked by our own intentional misuse of forces and energies. So on Christmas, we might as well start in maybe this year by giving a present to ourselves. We, uh, we won't probably fail to do that, though, on one ground or another. We will remember ourselves rather generously, probably, or try to. But uh, there is a gift we must give ourselves that is the bestowal of the blessing of the Holy Spirit upon our works. The things that we do should be blessed in themselves. They should be things that mean something. There should be a prayer go with each one. There should be a recognition that there is this tremendous potential of doing it right and being honorable about things, which we have begun to overlook. So with our giving, we must also give to ourselves. And to do this, we might have to sit down quietly somewhere during this Christmas season 
and simply think through our own lives. See what we are doing with the wonderful um, embodiment with which we have been invested. What are we doing with the divine in our own hearts and minds? Hearts. Are we building a bridge to this mysterious power that is forever but gently knocking at the door of our hearts? Is it not true, therefore, that somewhere along the line, heart can be the bestower of a great gift upon us? The gift that it bestows is love. And love is not something that forms an egotistic center. The individual doesn't love himself. Some do, but it's a mistake. What we really do under the heading or by the name of love, we mean a release of the spirit by which all things are redeemed. Love is therefore a great feeling of compassion to all that lives. It is a great urge to serve need wherever it exists. It is also a, serve, a need to serve the beautiful, to help everything that is growing and doing things. Man can love the stars and the sky and the flowers, the birds, animals, insects, everything. It's all are part of this tremendous world over which man has been given stewardship. We have been made stewards of this planet. We have been given the authority to be the gardeners of the garden of the Lord, or as the Muslim calls it, the garden of Allah. This is the great garden that we were supposed to take care of. This is the great garden which would have everything in it that we need if our own hearts were right. And we must also realize that in the heart and soul of things, love is always kind. The love of fanaticism is no answer to anything. To destroy in the name of God is superstition. Uh, to resent the honest beliefs of other people is a mistake. But to recognize that we are all servants together in a mystery beyond our own knowledge or understanding, that we are truly gardeners and stewards in the garden of the Lord. We are here to make this a beautiful place. We are here not just to turn it into a vast factory or to develop vast the monopolies of trade. We are here to see that the good things which we have in nature are protected. We must protect the air that we breathe, the water that we drink, the fire with which we heat things. We must protect all these things. We must use them wisely. We are not here to ravage the earth. We are not conquerors to plunder the planet. We are here as servants of eternal beauty and eternal love. And if we serve these things as people, as a race, as a humanity, all else will be added unto us. There can be no need for any of the ills with which we are afflicted, except that we afflict them, afflict the world with our own mistakes, because we will not use the emotion of love honestly. So we have in the Bible that God loves humanity. We have in the New Testament the love of Jesus for his world. We have all through these great sacred writings a great compassion, a great solicitude for life, a great joy at the thought of beauty and of peace and of understanding. So each year, the curtain goes up for another year. What are we going to do with it? Are we going to do something with this to make it a step in that direction? Are we going to be a better world because of ourselves at the end of this new year? Or will we be in the same morass we're in now? The whole world is, has only one source of life. 
There is only one energy beyond, far above and beyond anything that laboratories can produce. There is one life in everything that exists. And in the terms of their eternal natures, all things are one. It is the mind that has divided them, and it is ambition that has turned them against each other. We cannot continue this way without suffering. Now, it is not within the means of the average person to make great changes in civilization. But this is not too important. The great important thing is that each individual tries to live a little nearer to the divine plan. After all, life here is short. We have only a few years in which to prove or disprove the purpose of our mortal existence. We only have a little time, and then we must part from here to areas where our ambitions in temporal matters may be considered ineffective. We are going from a world of men's disabilities into a universe of divine realities. We can take with us only our love. We can take with us only our trust, our dedication, and our voluntary willingness to serve the divine plan. All the rest has to be left behind. We come into the world crying, and uh, we live the best we can. We do a few things well and make some mistakes. But in each case, there is some of good, some of beauty, some of truth. And we want to make more of it so that it will continue to serve us in times ahead. But when we leave here, are we leaving with as much soul power as possible? Can we honestly say as we depart from here that as far as we could, we have kept the rules of heaven, that we have tried to be good stewards, good keepers in the garden of the Lord, that we have not intentionally injured people, we have not cheated or disabled them, we have not ridiculed or corrupted their dreams and hopes and aspirations, we have not bound them to some military machine to die for a despot. We are trying, and have tried in life, uh, to be of good value that the divine power may work through us. Jesus told his disciples in substance that his presence in them would always be working his work, his labor. Oh, Paul puts it in the words, Christ in you, the hope of glory. And this Christ in us is the spirit of good in us, the spirit of self-sacrificing service, a service that may die in order to save, a life that is, may be tortured in order to redeem, but a, a life of service, a life of natural virtue. If we could assume that the great power that controls the world is not this power of empire, but the simple power of truth in our hearts, that love is the final solution to all the conflicts of human existence. So if we can begin to think in this way, if we can begin to dream this type of dream, we will find the new year is going to bring us benefits. It's going to gradually release us from the various debilities that we have created for ourselves. If we study medically, scientifically, psychologically, the patterns of human life, we will realize that in most cases, people are their own worst enemies. We are not suffering really from the great sorrows of the world. We are suffering for the daily mistakes we make ourselves. We are suffering physically for our neglect of the body or the misuse of its functions. Uh, we are suffering emotionally from hates, grievances, and uh, various inordinances of uh, uh, emotional existence. Then we are making ourselves mentally ill, uh, even to a psychotic state, by our destructive thinking, by the fact that we use the mind as a tyrant, that we use it to support various schemes when it should be used to advance the cause for which it was intended. For the purpose of the mind is to serve truth, and find ways by which it can be manifested in our moral and daily living. 
So we are mostly our own risk enemies, and we pay for it. We pay in aches and pains and doctor's bills. We pay it in all kinds of antagonisms, broken homes, unhappiness. Wherever selfishness comes in, sorrow comes with it. So in this season, we receive not only a new opportunity, but in Christian mysticism, a new establishment in the heart and love of Christ. We are here to receive another benediction, that each of us may receive a Pentecostal mystery in ourselves, so that each of us will receive a ray of the divine life which has come to us for the service and betterment of all mankind. We are only a Christians if Christ in us rules our conduct. We are only of true faith of in any other religion if the principles of that religion are fulfilled in conduct, if the religion says love one another, we either love one another or we are heretics. There is no compromise possible. We've tried for ages and ages to make life unbearable for each other in the effort to find some way to convince God that he should do something for us. Therefore, we pray, but we do not work. We ask, but we do not give. And for these mistakes, we are in constant sorrow. If we can, therefore, start a little bit now in this new year, just simply to get over some of the problems that have beset us, let's make a little thoughtful list of some of the things that we have carried forward as unfinished business. How about the broken home? Is there anything that can be done to save it? Why was it broken in the first place? What were the real causes? Were these causes due to divine uh, misunderstandings? Were they principles that you could not violate? Or were they simply human attitudes, selfishness, fighting selfishness, egotism, fighting egotism, and the undisciplined struggling to escape discipline? All of these things... If they are weaknesses, we should correct them. If they are strengths and they are wrong, we must overcome them. But at the same time, we must do something. Now, in this coming year, there are lots of little odds and ends. We can begin to think in more kindly terms of people. In this country, particularly in the last 25 or 50 years, we have become a world of critics. Uh, we criticize and condemn and very often have no idea of what we're talking about. We accept words, we accept uh, the media and all these things to do our thinking for us. We hate what we do not know, we reject what we never understood, and we continue to blame somebody else for the corruptions of our lives. These things have to change. If someone is doing it wrong, this is too bad. We can only pray that they will correct their own mistakes. No matter what an individual may do, we do not hate them. We may disagree with them. We may dislike their policies and their practices. But somewhere inside of them is a soul fighting against itself, a soul that has been corrupted or damaged by its own mind. The person has gone bad because of ambition, cupidity hypersensitivity, uncontrolled hates and angers, deceptions. All these things have had a bearing upon it. Uh, there's a little story I like very much. Uh, about Japan, there was this uh, Japanese gentleman who uh, was very arrogant, very total self-centeredness, and uh, not too admirable a person in his general conduct. And one day he met on the road a Buddhist priest and he stood facing the priest and the face, priest faced him and then very slowly and quietly the, piece, the priest bowed very deeply before this man and someone who was standing by uh, saw this happen and he turned to the priest and he said why did you bow to this man who had made all these mistakes and is not a good man well, the priest said, in the first place, I bow to that which is behind the mistakes, because somewhere back there, 
there is a divine power, and that I bow to. And from a purely physical condition, bowing is excellent for the stomach. <laughs> so between the spiritual integrities and the physical intensities, bowing to that which is in inferior is an illusion, because down inside of everything that is inferior, if it is alive, is the, is the splendor of God. To get these things into manifestation is not easy, but they must come into manifestation. And the thing that brings them usually is trouble. The vicissitudes and dangers and damages of life are the first things that help to overcome that innate selfishness and self-centeredness of individuals. Finally, the person who has been patriotic to his politics comes to the realization that it is better to be patriotic to the divine truths which we all must serve. Actually, then, we like to think of this Christmas no lot longer as merely a time of spending too much money or grudging what we buy or getting what we do not need. All of this is, a, is the trivia. Much of it is nothing more or less than the fact we want to spend the money on ourselves instead of somebody else. Also, however, there is a gesture here, even a gesture of the most commonplace nature, to remember a person, because we like them even a little bit, is a step in the right direction. But under all the other types of things, uh, let us try to understand uh, what may be our ancestors had more of an understanding of, especially my esteemed grandmother, whom I can mention in this respect. Grandmother never sent a Christmas card in her life. That would have been all very bad taste. She would sit by the hour and in a fine old Spencerian hand write the most beautiful Christmas messages for all her friends. Each one was for a person, for a reason. Each one was done without any haste or consideration of it. One of these nicely written cards or slips might take two hours of her own time. But in it she said something to make that person feel better or to know that they were not forgotten. She knew what they were if they were sick. She knew if they had been bereaved. She knew if they just had a new member in the family. And she made all these things and sent a blessing for all of them for the Christmas season. This is the type of thing that came before uh, we got so busy that we had to turn to all these other methods. But regardless of what we use, down inside of ourselves, there has to be a certain gift of our own consciousness. We must try to do something to make certain that somebody else knows that we care, that in some mysterious way we are standing in that place where a person is standing when he prays. In other words, we pray. Maybe for the things we need. Maybe for love and understanding. Maybe for solace in, in sacrifice and loss. But when we pray to God in the silence of ourselves, up to now it has been not a little noticeable that the prayers are answered. But they're not answered by deity in person. They are answered by the deity in someone else whom we know. We find that the good things that come to us come from people. But they come from that divine part of people. We pray to God for help, and the God in Anaiba helps us. We pray for food, and a stranger feeds us. So that all of the answers to prayers including prayers directed to things that we could do, are answered by human beings through the God in themselves. This is very important because it is demonstrable everywhere you turn. Always the answer comes from a person. But it comes not just from that person, but from the God in that person. The person has something that will answer the need. And the prayer goes to that soul, to that God, and inspires it to share with us that which it needs. Therefore, we are always working in a universe of divine matters uh, administered by human dedications. We are in a world in which all the things that we do are part of a great plan of doing. 
All of our giving is part of the eternal giving. We give all kinds of things at this season, but the silent and invisible source of life gives all things, not only at this season, but whenever it is necessary. So Christmas is a time of mysterious and secret giving, and that was the secret of St. Nicholas of, Ma of Myra. This good old prelate, if we can believe the story, it's a shame they uh, took him off of the calendar of saints. They've left on some that were much less desirable. <laughs> but uh, anyway, that hasn't done any good because the devout love him just as much. But uh, maybe they got rid of him because on one occasion it is reported that he sold the gold and silver ornaments on the altar of his church to use the money to buy bread for the poor. That might have got him in trouble with the hierarchy, but I suspect that a power within himself was able to compensate for the other loss because we are all uh, constantly mistaking uh, material solutions. The material solution helps, but the solution is only immediate and for the moment. We feed the hungry man, but the universal law says there should be no hunger. All these things have to be brought into harmony with life and with truth. And in a little way, we open a door at the Christmas season, come out for a moment into a larger universe, sometimes do not like the climate out there, and go back into ourselves again. This we do. The climate outside makes us uh, unhappy because we're expected to be generous or kind or something of that nature. But in the real analysis of things, Christmas is a door opening and reminding us forever of the soul within us. It is reminding us of the beauty and truth and wonder and love that are locked within each one of us and which can be brought out by proper care and, and nurturing. Now, the bringing out of the divine within ourselves is the primary function of religion. Religion is not to give us a God. Religion is to release through us the God that is always there. Religion is helping the individual to change from the worship of himself as an ego uh, to the acceptance of the divine power as the universal soul within himself and nature. Therefore, religion helps people because it makes them, for a time perhaps, a little more generous, a little more thoughtful, a little more temperate, and makes them try to keep, at least for a short time, the, the uh, Ten Commandments or the Beatitudes. These, however, are not permanent solutions. They are merely ways in which we get an impulse to do something a little better. So we might, uh, this time, uh, most of us here have really tried pretty hard uh, to be better people. We want very much to help people. We want to enlighten them and share with them everything that would make for a better life. And we do it. Most people here who come to our facts and also to most churches are here because they want to understand. They want to love. They want to be loved. And they know that as human beings they love. And as children of divinity, they are loved by God and nature. With these supports, they are trying. But uh, most of the time, the pressures kind of irritate, and they tear down the, the inner vision of peace and quietude. Uh, we find irritation very difficult to overcome. And yet irritation is much more forgivable in people who have no insight than it is in those who are trying to grow. Uh, the, the vibratory situation gets into this problem also. Uh, where you have a conflict of vibration, you have a very serious situation. If an individual has built up a strong, devout, devout and constructive inner life and then goes into a tantrum for some reason or other, the, dis the destruction is far more than we see. It would look sometime, if we could make a symbol of it, like a major eruption in Mount Etna. It would be a complete conflict, a shattering, 
And then when the individual has grown to the point where the peace within himself is taking over and it is shattered by a very bad example of misunderstanding or destruction, the, the individual receives a serious internal blow. It's much worse than if he had never tried to be better. Because if he never tried to be better, these lower parts of his nature, still dominant, would always react in the same way. But when you try very hard to do it right, and then get a terrific impulse to do it wrong, this is bad. And it's something that we must all watch against as much as possible. We must try to make sure that in moments of emergency, that we allow the inner life to continue to lead and not interfere with it because it interferes with our personal feelings. Well, the personal feelings of the individual must never interfere with the inner tranquility which he is seeking to establish for his own good. As a punishment for inconsistencies of this kind, we have sickness, and a great deal of sickness is simply conflict. It is the growing part of the individual being struck by an early frost. It is something in which the good is suddenly injured, and a high vibration that is slowly building up is torn down, fragmented, and left in, dis in disorder. When we study thought forms and these types of things, we see that every attitude the human being holds is a thought form, composed of symbols, and many of these symbols have been drawn out to be made into emblem books and things of this nature. But in some substance, these symbols are light of different colors and are patterns of various intensities. And this light field of the human body is a glorious and radiant thing. It's almost impossible to imagine that a mystic who has been privileged to see this mysterious superphysical part of man could ever be again a materialist because the, the presence of the supreme, the enduring, the eternal, surviving over and penetrating the temporal and the, in, uh, the unstable. These, this pattern is truly extraordinary. But if we go along pretty well, we have a really good uh, f feeling uh, and use of energy, we get out and we do something for someone. We go out and we, we do an errand for a person who is disabled. Uh, we go out and take care of a child, or we go out and do some physical act, paint a house, or do something of this nature. We've used energy. This energy is supported by the etheric and vital double of the physical body. And while we do this, the body moved and dominated by eye motive, this energy is radiant and useful and fine. But if, on the other hand, we use this energy to injure, to hurt, to strike, uh, to uh, in some way corrupt, the vital body is badly disordered. The vital body, therefore, is punished by the physical and mental attitudes of the individual to whom it belongs. The individual punishing his emotional body scatters its colors and vibrations and turns it into a very dismal-looking cauldron of abuses. Therefore, the magnetic fields of the body take on immediately the consequences of attitudes. They can cause grave problem. These various fields are all bound directly or indirectly to the endocrine glands or the various central organs of the body. Therefore, the abuses of any of these energies will result in depletions in their physical functions. And when this depletion sets in, sickness comes with it. And sickness is one of the inevitable punishments. Now, sickness is not always this type of punishment. There are people who have had very beautiful lives and have been ill. But this is due mostly in those cases to the depletion of energy or the presence of factors and forces over which the individual has no control, such as uh, air pollution or war and things of this nature. There are major disasters the individual cannot completely escape. But even if he cannot escape them, if he has risen above them within himself, 
he will be able to handle the situation with peace of mind and with full veneration for deity. All the things we have to do is, is to sort out and arrange and organize the various motives and attitudes that we have. It sounds like it's rather complicated, but it isn't really, because most people are not that complicated themselves. They have a few problems that need attention, and uh, Christmas is a good time uh, to think them over very, very carefully. And perhaps this is a good time to hang up your own sock on the mantelpiece or on the windowsill or wherever it might be and put a message in it addressed to yourself, a gift of good counsel that you will read the rest of the year. This type of thing could have a kind of humorous, gentle, whimsical way of getting at a major and important circumstance. We are all here to try to solve the relationship between deity and creation. We are here to fulfill the labors of the infinite. We are here to do the best we can to be faithful servants in the house of the Lord. And to the degree that we do these things and keep these bounds, bonds, and obey these rules, to those degrees we are comparatively happy, comparatively comfortable, and have a real and pressing reason for existence. When we are serving good, we have a reason to live. When we serve only ourselves, it is doubtful if we have any reason at all. But whatever it is, this year, let's make uh, the idea of Christmas a symbol of the presentation of a great spiritual opportunity. That there has come to us another day in which we may be, produce within our own natures a kind of prayer that we become a living endorsement of God that our personal lives become continuous prayers prayers of beauty not of pain prayers of fulfillment not of frustration prayers of happiness and not dolefulness the real purpose of religion is to do right and be happy happiness is the natural reward for being right. And the more right we become, the happier we are. And when the world gets to be right, humanity will dwell in happiness in a golden age yet to come. We are all working towards betterness. And Christmas is a time of year in which these things should be very strongly thought about. They should be given a lot of definite uh, reflection. Not reflection that is dour or dark or dismal or guilt-laden, but a reflection upon the privileges that await us if we will earn the right to have them. That each day there is a possibility for us to play a little closer to the divine purpose. That we, that we can do things that need doing with great cheer, and having done them will be recalled by the power within ourselves and rewarded. For when we do things right, that voice in our own soul answers and says, Well done, good and faithful servant. We are all in need of this type of thing. We are wearing out the delusions of existence. We are overcoming one by one the false values which have caused us to have so much trouble. Now the important thing is to continue this process very simply, without drama, without tremendous uh, falderall, just in the simple, quiet way of making love the leader of our lives, making kindness the sole purpose of our conduct, and compassion the power to forgive all things in the name of that which is eternally right. If we do these things with good hope, I think we'll all have a very happy uh, Christmas season, and I wish you all the blessings of that season and a very happy new year to come. Thank you.